Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Colleen Parsons, and our guest today is Vona Grork, Irish poet. Vona grew up in the Midlands in Ireland uh, and has published seven books of poetry, starting with Shale in 1994. Her most recent are Spindrift, 2009, and X, 2014. And she has an eighth book of poetry coming out very shortly, Double Negative, in May 2019. Vona's prizes and awards are actually too many to mention, but I'll give you a sense uh, of all of them when I tell you that she's won the Hennessy Award, the Forward Prize, the Brendan Behan Memorial Prize, the Michael Hartnett Award, the Strokestown International Poetry Prize, and she's also been nominated for the, for the prestigious Irish Times Poetry Now Award. She teaches creative writing at the University of Manchester, and this year, 2018-2019, she's a Coleman Fellow at the New York Public Library. All this to say, Vona is a poet who is held in the highest regard by her fellow poets and by all who read her work. With its exuberant delight in words and sounds and its intimate descriptions of family and love and its geographical in-betweenness as it moves from land to sea and back again. Vona, welcome to The Writing Life. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. So the series is called The Writing Life, so I figured maybe we could talk a little bit about writing and life and ask you when you started to write and when you knew that this life was a writing life for you. You know, I think I wrote as a child because I grew up in the countryside. I'm the youngest of six children um, and I think it was quite a solitary life and I think writing was a, reading and writing was a way of um, giving myself a city, giving myself a world and bringing it into, into my life in that way. And because I was reading, you know when you're a child you don't make a, a, a distinction. If you're reading you think, oh yeah, I can, I can write that. You don't, you, know, you don't have that sort of uh, self-consciousness. So I wrote as a child. When I went to study in Trinity College, I thought, oh, there's so much wonderful stuff that's already been written I have nothing to add so I didn't write for about six seven years and then I picked it up again after after that and I've been doing it kind of steadily since it's an important part of my life it's the thing that I can't imagine not having in my life I mean I like that you say that you uh, you can just imagine yourself writing I've never thought that um, who were you reading that made you feel that way um, as a young writer and then also in Trinity that you were overwhelmed by well, as a, as a young writer, uh, as a child, um, I grew up in the house. Now, it's the countryside, so it's not next door exactly. It's a few fields away. But uh, Oliver Goldsmith, the, the, the Irish poet, had lived, had grown up in the parsonage, which was the next farm to ours. And people used to quote his famous poem, The Deserted Village. You know, they'd quote it at weddings or they'd quote it just in ordinary speech. And so a poem was not a rarefied, exotic object to me. It was something that was kind of to a large extent, part of the conversation that people would have. So I didn't have, again, this kind of artificial distinction between everyday speech and poetry. So and that was that was kind of important for me, I think. And then later on, when uh, I was reading, you know, Shakespeare and Elizabeth Bishop and um, Marvell and John Donne and people like that, and I was thinking, these are better than anything I could write. And when you're 18, that's enough, I think, to make you think, no, I'll stop doing it. And then later on, you, you, you get kind of, um, you know, you start to shake yourself down a little and say, well, I, I'll, I'll have a go, you know, just because that work is wonderful doesn't mean that I can't make something that I, I think is, is good. Um, so uh, I got in, into it again then and, and was reading uh, contemporary British poetry and um, American poetry, Irish poetry, kind of everything I could I could read, really. I remember Geoffrey Hill being terribly important to me yeah. at one stage and Larkin. Uh, I've mentioned Elizabeth Bishop already. Um, Sylvia Plath, um, terrific poet. Sometimes the, the poems get submerged in, in the story of the yeah. life, but the poems are just so instructive, really. Um, what she does with metaphor is just extraordinary. So I was reading an awful lot and it did filter into the work, I think. I like that you say that there's no distinction really between everyday life and the work of or the language of poetry. Um, in, many, in many ways, your poetry is the poetry of the everyday life and very ordinary things, like a poem about Skype. Um, uh, to what extent do you feel that that's sort of the work that you're doing as a poet, is to illuminate the ordinary and the everyday? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose I don't deal with rarefied subject matter. No. Um, and I do, I, I suppose I do think about my own life, my own experience, but it's not about, I'm not trying to broadcast myself. I'm, I'm, yeah. I suppose really all writers use their writing as a way to think about what connects them with other people. Yeah. And that might be experiential. So, you know, I do write about what it's like to be a middle-aged Irish woman poet. Um, I'm interested in that, not just because I want people to notice that about me, because I'm, I'm thinking, well, you tell, I'll tell you this, and then you tell me that. Um, so I think the, the experience behind the poem is not necessarily rarefied, but I do work on the language to try and make it different to the language that I use when I'm yeah. living life. I do try to give it something, some, a different kind of energy, uh, a different kind of purpose, uh, and I think a different sort of stealth. And there's also, you know, the way that you speak to other poets or speak out of yourself is through form. Uh, and you're very interested in, I think, the sonnet in particular, also Tarsarima and all of these, uh, these forms. I wonder to what extent do you think there's a sort of a fit or a disjunction between the rigidities of form and the sort of the, the, the fluency of everyday life, in a sense? Well, I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, area to think about. I'm not that rigid when I use form. Like yeah. I do write a lot of sonnets um, and they're mostly Italian sonnets. They're the eight and the six. But, you know, I'm not necessarily uh, working the meter particularly. I'll, 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 I'll pick and choose what elements of the form I want to work with. So I might choose the, the eight and six. I might choose the rhyme or the half rhyme, but I might not use the meter. Um, and I think that's fine. I think in this day and age, I, I, I would be very wary of being too hamstrung by, by form. I think it's, it's there as part of what we get to choose. Um, I, I don't ever want to write poems that are formal and only formal, yeah. you know, that tick the boxes yeah, yeah. of form, but don't really do anything else. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in having everything be correct and somebody giving me a gold star and saying, yes, well done, that's a, that's a, that's a perfect sonnet. <laughs> if it doesn't do anything else, you wanted to do the other thing as well, which is to actually say something in a, in a, in a fresh way and to strike somebody else as saying something in a fresh way because poetry can be very boring. And so as a poet, you really want to avoid writing yet another boring poem. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, in a way, it's like it's, it's a shape on which to hang the ideas in some sense, it, yes. or a box. And I'm thinking yeah. of your, your, your poem about architecture, shapes and boxes. But speaking of your poetry, maybe uh, would you like to read a couple of poems for us uh, now? Yes, for sure. I'll, I'll start with a poem that's set in, in Spiddle, which is a, uh, a small village in the west of Ireland, where I believe you're from. I am indeed, um, yeah. And this is a poem about something that happens there in the summer. It being a Gaeltacht area, students, as you know, go to study Irish there. Um, and they enjoy being by the sea because they don't necessarily come from seaside areas originally. And there's a very big um, pier, a big um, famine built stone pier. Um, and what the, the Gael goers, the, the Irish students love to do is to climb up to the top of it and throw themselves off it. And I've often watched them and I've often thought how much I would like to do it. And hard on that desire comes the acknowledgement that I'm much too chicken to ever <laughs> do such a thing. So this poem is my way of doing it. And it opens with a, a small quote from Auden from one of his sonnets from China. And the quote is, speak to our muscles of a need for joy. Pier. Left at the lodge and park, snout to America. Stripped to togs, a shouldered towel, flip flop over the tarmac past the gang planked rooted barge, two upended rowboats and trawlers biding time. Nod to a fisherman propped on a bollard, exchange the weather, climb the final steps up to the ridge and then let fly, push wide, tuck up your knees so the blue nets hold you wide open that extra beat. Gulp, cloud, fling a jet trail round your neck like a feather boa, toss every bone and sinew to the plunge. Enter the tide as if it were nothing, really nothing to do with you. Kick back, release your ankles from its coiled ropes, slit water, drag it open, catch your breath, haul yourself up into August, do it over, raucously, head first, this time shout. I think that's quite brave. I, 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 it's a poem that flies itself, a little bit like your poetry in flight. Oh. Uh, there was another one you were going to read uh, 
yes. related to this. Yeah. Yes, so it's also set in, in the same place. And uh, the, the, the west of Ireland, um, all down along the seaboard, has um, probably more traditional vernacular Irish cottages than anywhere else in the country. And I guess the hallmarks of this kind of house are very thick walls, usually about three foot, to try and keep the weather out, very small windows, and traditionally um, a straw made of thatch or straw. Um, and this um, this poem has the title, it's an Irish title, Irish language, on Choc Thi, which means the thatched house. Thistledown, fuchsia, flagstone floor. This noun house has the wherewithal to sit out centuries, squat between bog water darkness and rooms turned inside out to summer, straw coloured months of childhood answering each other like opposite windows in thick set walls that sunlight will cajole. Tea roses bluster the half door, rain from eaves footfalls the gravel. A robin, cocksure of himself, frittered away all morning in the shrub. If I knew how to fix in even one language the noise of his wings in flight, I wouldn't need another word. I love that one. Uh, I, that on Chakti makes me think of uh, the sort of the echoes of Irish that are visible in places in your poetry. And certainly not, um, certainly not the most obvious part as you pick up, say, flight or, or spindrift. But wonder if you'd tell me a little bit about the sense that you have of your language being shadowed by Irish. If you do, you, you can also not. I think <laughs> it's it's unavoidable. Um, um, I grew up speaking English. Um, I also grew up learning Irish for yeah. 14 years. You learn Irish very intensively and I must have had something close to to fluid Irish by the time that I, I, um, I, I stopped doing, stopped being at school at the age of 18. But um, I haven't used it since. But it's very important to me in an odd way. I don't speak it, but it's very important to me that yeah. it's there because I think it, it, the language that I use, and Joyce talks about this in A Portrait of the yeah. Artist when he talks about, um, when, when he says to the dean, the, the, the language was yours before it was mine. Um, so English is a borrowed language. It's something that belonged to somebody else before it came to us. But we have our language that inflects um, the English that we use and it inflects the rhythms. It's very different because I live in England and English spoken in Ireland is really quite different very to English different, spoken yeah. in English in, in England. So uh, and I think the difference is that one set of English knows about itself through Irish or knows about itself as being different from Irish. Um, and has that behind it as, as a kind of shadow, as a kind of ballast, as a kind of set of reference. Um, but I think it's it's terribly important to Irish English, the Irish languages. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the critic Laura O'Connor calls uh, Irish English haunted English. Haunted and English, I think that's, that's a good, good way to describe Sir Chak Thi. Um, you did some translation yourself recently, uh, well, relatively recently, from uh, Queen Artie Lyra, the mm -hmm. 18th century Irish poem. I should say, uh, it's certainly not the first time that this poem has been translated. Um, what did you think you could bring to it? It was in a the, new translation. Yeah, it, it, it had been translated by many very good poets, including yeah. Frank O'Connor and Sean O'Thuma and Seamus Heaney and Paul Muldoon, um, etc. Um, but a woman poet had never had a go at it. I didn't realise you were Dillon. the first. Uh, I was yeah, the, uh, yeah. Eilish Dillon did a translation of it in the 60s. Yeah. Um, but uh, Eilish was not a poet. She was a prose writer. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very fine translation, but I thought, well, what would it be like if an Irish woman were to deal with this and, and see what she could make of it? Um, it's a very so, touching, a very moving poem. It's a beautiful poem. It's yeah. extraordinarily beautiful. And it's, it's actually much more beautiful in the Irish yeah. than it is in any translation, including mine. That it works a three beat line and it has a rhythm that is stately and convincing and, and just utterly compelling in Irish. Yeah. But you try doing a three beat line over a long period in English and it's just uh, it's a, you can't listen to Very it. Very difficult, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, so there were decisions like that uh, that I had to make. But I have to say, uh, I have to fess up that my Irish wasn't good enough to do a direct translation of the Irish oh, into right. English. So what I was doing really was a translation of the other translations that had been done. 
So um, I was working with like about 15 different translations out on the table and I was looking at all of those as well as the original, as well as Angela Burke's cribs on the mm -hmm. keen yeah. uh, and direct translations, ones that aren't being translated into poetry, but that are actually attending to word by word in, in um in Ireland of Connell's Lament. So mine was a kind of synthetic exercise as opposed to being a true translation. Did you have a sense of something having been lost in all of the others in that, you know, it's a, the definition of translation as a carrying over to another language. Did you have a sense in reading all of those translations of something that was lost that maybe you could yes. represent in some way? I, I really felt what was lost was a sense of how the speaker of the poem, who was speaking it at a moment of um, intense passion, Deep anguish. Yes, deep yeah. anguish. How much she actually loved her husband, how much she fancied him. That kind of sexual charge yeah. that I felt was there in the Irish was not being, I thought, translated into the English versions that already existed. Um, so I thought that that was something that I wanted to look at as well, to try and get that, the, the kind of rawness, the viscerality, the intense emotion back into it to, to shake off some of the, the polish, if you like, That's that it had accrued. Uh, I think you have a couple more poems that you might read for us um, today. Uh, you can introduce them, obviously. Yes, um, the, here's a little one um, about something that was very important in my household home. Um, uh, and people of a certain age, I think, will remember this artifact. Uh, a doily, a paper doily or um, um, a, a fabric doily as being an ornamental device that you would produce when you wanted to show off and pretend that, you know, something special was happening. So if a visitor came, you would not put biscuits on a plate. Heaven, heaven forbid, <laughs> you would have to have a doily underneath the biscuits to show that you were posh. Um, so this is a poem about that. And I, I grew up on a farm. Um, in the middle of Ireland, you know, posh, sophisticated. These were not the kind of adjectives that you would necessarily <laughs> reach for in describing any homestead of that kind, but the doily was to stand in for all of that. No one uses doilies anymore. So why do I hold the word to the window? So the holes in the pattern are years ago and a visitor has come. Impossible to talk of the mart or Qatar as though dazed clumps and clods of them could be glamoured by a paper doily placed nicely on a plate. Here, so for this poem only, is its wheel of stars and star-shaped flowers, an inkling of words as ornament, the way stars and yes, flowers are. Very beautiful. You hold the word to the light. It makes me think of that poem Bodkin as well of yours. The beauty of that poem in which you, like Doily, so turn the word over and over again. Yeah. You're very driven by these sounds and the sort of the yeah. unusual words in a sense. I don't really want to write poems that are just a transcription. I want the language to pass through some sort of a filter which filters out all the inconsequential language, yeah. the marketing language, the, the slogans and the sound bites. I, I, I would love um, to be able to just dispense with all of that and to put language in, in close relationship with meaning and with effect and with an effect that it might have on a listener, not a manipulative effect in the way that advertising and political slogans and so on have definite designs, but um, language that's out for something else, that's attentive to itself, that isn't necessarily manipulative, but that is still effective. But there's in communicating. something transformative and enchanting yes. about it. Enchanting is a good word. That's what yeah. I that's what I strike for. Yeah. Do you think you get it? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not the, well, I want to get it. That's what keeps me writing. And yeah. maybe maybe not being able to say yes to that to that question is what makes me want to keep writing and, and keep writing books and keep striving for um, for exactly that, to try and nail it at some point. Yeah, very good. I was thinking, I was struck, and I know you've, you've one more poem um, that you're, you're thinking of reading, because I was struck by, you know, I, I teach Irish literature to a lot of undergraduates, and they tell me that Irish people are stuck in the past, uh, they write about history all the time, and I was really interested in rereading your poems over the last few weeks. I was really interested in the way that you're oriented towards a, a different direction, towards a future towards not thinking constantly about sort of where we've come from and how we've, but, yeah. but trying to imagine the really difficult thing of, thing of what a future looks like. And in a sense, this, this next poem you're going to read, well, I don't want to give it away, but it 
give us maybe a sense of what that future writing looks like. Well, I think one of the really interesting things about poetry is that it's aware of silence, perhaps because it's positioned on a page and it doesn't fill the whole yeah. of the page. Um, and the white space stands in for silence. It's like the negative of the positive of, of the language. Um, so I think that idea of poetry resting itself from silence is awfully compelling to me. Yeah. So this poem is, is about silence, really, and is about um, the, the, the strange and yet utterly compelling task we set ourselves to, to try and strike a silent note in words. You know, um, as, so, Be as Beckett said, words are a stain upon silence, yeah. and yet necessary. And yet yeah. necessary, yeah, yeah. We can't be a poet without them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this uses uh, my dog um, to try and get at that because I think actually animals know something about stillness that uh, we sometimes forget. We also know, um, and uh, this is about her when she was um, old and, and blind. It's not a sentimental poem, though. I, I did not want to write a sentimental poem about mm. a dog, but it is nonetheless a poem about a dog. It's in two parts. This being still, one. With the dog's head on my foot asleep, it seems wrong to move. She's getting old, doddery, walks into doors and stumbles off curbs, feels her way by the edge of my voice. I have brought her to an island of cropped light and few words, her silence just as diffuse as my own. She keeps close into me. It is a small gift to the world, I reckon. This, our being still. Two. In no time, at the clatter of a winter bird, or my book falling, or the heat kicking in, she will rise to the surface of the last of day, and I will meet her milky gaze to wonder what I wanted to begin with. An imagination of a very complex future uh, uh, at that moment. I mean, it is a little sen sentimental. The dog's getting old, you have to admit. Not <laughs> just the dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, there is, a, there is a sense in which you know, your, your poetry is oriented towards trying to wrest itself from, I, I feel, from a sort of a, a dead hand of history, the nightmare of history that Stephen Dedalus talks about. And yet there's also that stunning poem from is a 2002 Imperial Measure. Um, where you talk about the food that's being served in the GPO yeah. in 1916. Yeah. It was a beautiful, lively, vibrant poem. How did you, how did you come to that? Uh, I, I had been reading oral histories of yeah. the, the Easter Rising. Um, and of course, everybody now has their Easter Rising poem because we've just had the centenary. Right, yeah, but I was struck then, by how early your poem was. <laughs> yeah, you see, yeah, I'm that's an advanced I asking, planner. Yeah. Um, I just thought, okay, so how do you write about a poem uh, how do you write about an event which has been so chronicled, um, which has been chronicled officially and also that all these oral histories exist? And I didn't want to tell an historical version of it. So I thought, what is what is coming through the oral history? What do people remember? Yeah. And I thought, food. Food is, food is the key to it, because if you're planning a surprise rising, you can't stockpile food because somebody might say, where are you going with all the bread? And is that a gun? All those cows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay, this is my in. And in a way, that's what you're always looking for. Yeah. It doesn't have to be an historical subject. You're always looking for an in, something that surprises you about a subject. Even if you're just talking about being a middle-aged woman, you're still looking for an in on that, something that brings the subject matter to illuminated life. And once you have that, then the poem has a, a starting place. Yeah, a, I thought it was a very beautiful and very delicate poem. It, it's also part of like a whole series of poems that describe interiors in many ways. Uh, are, you, are you obsessed with architecture? You have that whole collection uh, on other people's houses. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm certainly interested yeah. in architecture and I'm interested in the, the, I suppose, the stories we tell ourselves by the spaces that we surround ourselves yeah. in. Um, and... Uh, you know, the colours we choose, the shapes we choose, the, I suppose the fictions that we propose um, using things that are not of us, that are not our bodies. Yeah. We still project ourselves into the world using, you know, throws and cushions and so on. Um, so I'm awfully, I'm, I am awfully interested in that, the idea of built space, of curated space, even if it's just a home. Um, 
obsessed by it. In a way, you see, the poem is, and we know that the the the, the Italian word stanza means room, yeah. and we know yeah. that it, that's the the building block of of poetry. So it does all connect. I think this idea of of using space, of strategically manipulating or deploying space in order to say something. Now, whether it's choosing, you know, neon pink throw cushions or whether it's choosing stanzas. Choosing stanzas. And, yeah. and it brings us back to the question about form and the sort of the, the, the possibilities of form in some sense. Yeah. Yeah. So we're nearly uh, out of time. Uh, and I have, I have one last question for you, really. Uh, and uh, it's not an easy one. Uh, you published your first book of poetry 25 years ago this year. Uh, and you're now bringing out your eighth how have you, as a poet, or how's your poetry changed over that time? It's gotten much worse. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> um, I think the next, well, I know that the next book that I'm bringing out, uh, Double Negative, is, is trying to be much freer and looser because I think it's very hard to be that. So to, to take everything that I've learned in the previous seven books about um, stripping language of all the faff that get that it that yeah. accrues to it, all trying the, to the fat. yeah, try, trying to get back to something leaner, more meaningful, and then to get it to relax. And I think that that's something that um, you talk about, you know, future projects about thinking about everything that is still to be done, as opposed to harking backwards. That's the thing I think for me that is still to be done: to write poems that are lyrical, that are committed to beauty in some way, but that are also relaxed and perhaps not so tightly coiled as my earlier poems were. That sounds really fascinating. I'm really looking forward to what's coming next, uh, Vona. It has been, Vona Grork, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, the pleasure was mine. It was delightful. Thank you, Colleen. I'm Colleen Parsons. Thank you for joining us today on this edition of Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs>